Today we are beginning a, <clears throat> a brand new series in the book of Nehemiah. So I'll invite you to open your Bible to Nehemiah. Um, easy way to find that is you just basically open to uh, the book of Psalms right in the middle of the book and go two books over. And uh, It's Job right before Psalms and then Nehemiah is right before Job. So it's almost... <clears throat> almost in the in the middle of the Bible. <clears throat> Nehemiah is one of those bo- one of the books of the Bible that I that, that I really love and, and I think it's I think it's wise for us to look at it and study it <clears throat> at least every few years. Because what it does is um, we don't always realize some walls that, that we build up or some walls that we're taking down in our own personal lives. And Nehemiah is the person that God chose to come in and rebuild the walls, the structure. One of the other things that I love about the book of Nehemiah is if we really read it, we can see that it is really our story. God is calling each person here to be in Nehemiah and to help to rebuild walls around us, whether it's in our family or our faith or in a community or even wherever you are traveling in the world. And that's, that's a great calling that God has given us in this life. So Nehemiah chapter 1, <clears throat> and here's what it says. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. <clears throat> now remember, the Jewish people had already been scattered to Babylon and kind of around the, the, the world. And Nehemiah is, um, is one of the people that actually gained prestige and honor in a king's place. And people came to him and said all the destruction that they saw in Jerusalem. Verse 3. The people said to me, Nehemiah, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then then he prayed out loud. O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave to your servant Moses saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this servant of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in receipt and revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And he says, I was cupbearer to the king. Gracious God, thank you for allowing us to begin this look into the life of Nehemiah that you worked in and through. Open our hearts and our eyes and our, and our minds today to your message that comes with no agenda except to preach and to proclaim the good news that you have written down in your word, the scriptures. And may we know salvation, your presence here and now and in the life to come. So we are your people. Amen. <sighs> Nehemiah was the man of the hour. He was the man that God used to go and to build and to rebuild the, uh, the structure, the, uh, the palace, the, or the, the uh, temple rather, and, and, and the city of Jerusalem. 
And yeah, he was distressed. He analyzed over everything was going on. He scrutinized it, and he felt the great burden of it in his heart. But he didn't stop there wallowing in self-pity. He, he, he got up, and he did something in the midst of his grief and took action and did something about it. <clears throat> as we read Scripture, we can see that there are many spiritual lessons as well as human lessons for us. One of the lessons is whenever God wants to get work done, he goes to people who are willing to do some work. Nehemiah probably thought that he never was going to go back to the place of Jerusalem. But God called him and, 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 and used him, as we'll see in the uh, upcoming weeks and chapters, that Nehemiah was the one that was willing to go because God said, I have some work for you to do. And he went. So God lays hold of people who are willing to do something. Now, in Nehemiah's day, there was work to be done for the Lord. And although, as you may know, in history of the content, uh, of context of this little book, there was only a small remnant who had already returned to Jerusalem. And there was much work that still needed to be done. So in 536 B.C., we know that Zerubbabel and Joshua brought back 50,000 Jews to Jerusalem. In 516 B.C., they rebuilt the temple. And in 457 B.C., there was a small revival under the prophet Ezra, whose book is before Nehemiah, but actually comes after the story of Nehemiah. And now we've reached the year 445, and it's a brand new day. It's a new hour. It's a new generation and the people of God. And God was looking for the man of the hour, someone to go to the ruined city to restore the walls, which signified safety and order. And the man to which God returned to, the man which God turned to in that hour was Nehemiah. The man which God turns to in the hours of today, wherever we are, it doesn't matter who, uh, what situation we're in or what city we're in, but is you. People that God calls is you. As we look throughout this book, we're going to see different characteristics of Nehemiah. First of all, we, we find out towards the end of the chapter that he was cupbearer to the king. And then he hears the call of God to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He becomes Nehemiah the builder. And by the end of this book, we find him as Nehemiah the governor of the city, actually overruling in all the affairs, religious and social, within the city. But in chapter 1, before God calls him, in verse 1, as such, we find him as the cupbearer of the king for King Adarexes. Adaxerxes, sorry. Now, the cupbearer was not just somebody um, that would just hold a cup. That's not what it means. It's not someone that just brings a cup to the king. It's not someone who, who always just tests it to make sure they're poisoned. It, it wasn't like a butler to the aristocracy or the aristocracy or to royalty that, that we have today in the world, but the cupbearer was to have great authority and responsibility. In fact, some have said that it was a position of great influence. Nehemiah would have been a confidant to the king. The king, in quiet hours, when he felt free and relaxed, would be able to bounce off Nehemiah some ideas. So he had to be qualified with some great wisdom and political aptitude. Some have said that we, he would have been an official of the court, wielding much power, and would have traveled along with the king on his various outings and excursions, and giving him advice on great matters of the kingdom. Now the reason that God turned to Nehemiah was not his position. The reason why God turned to Nehemiah to be the man of the hour were some of the characteristics that we can see here in this chapter. Number one is he was a man of burden. He was a man upon whom the burden that weighed heavy on God's heart weighed heavy on him too. He longed for the people in Jerusalem to see it rebuilt. And then he was a man of prayer. And he put that burden into his heart, into the articulation of the language of heaven. Prayer before the throne of grace. Sometimes we may feel like we pray and it feels like they just go up to the ceiling and we don't hear them. But we remember in Romans chapter 8 that even when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit inside of us prays to God, ex uh, reaching out to Him, groaning in words and phrases we don't understand, telling God what is truly on our hearts. 
third thing that we can see is he was a man of action. He wasn't just a man who knew what to do and knew how to pray about what needed to be done, but he was willing to get into his feet and do something about it. And because of those characteristics, Nehemiah became the man of the hour. How different this story might have been. How different it may have all turned out if the man that God had turned to had not been a man like Nehemiah, of his great spiritual character and caliber. If ever a crisis hour matched a man for the hour, it is found in Nehemiah, in the state of dereliction or confusion that is found in the city of Jerusalem. Now, it's not the man who makes the story. It's a story that makes the man, a story that makes the person. Many things come into our life that we think may be breaking of us happen to turn out to actually be the making of us because it's a story that makes us. It's a story of Jesus Christ that gives us great power and strength. It's a story of God through Jesus Christ that makes us who we are. Nehemiah does give us a graphic object lesson of the truths that lie behind the heart of all true service for God. The first one is he was a man of burden. Verses 1 to 3 show us that he lived in a state of carelessness around him. Psalm 79 kind of describes what the city was like after it had been taken into captivity and after the people have returned. This was the spirit of the situation. The nations have come up, come into your inheritance, God. They've defiled your holy temple. They've made Jerusalem a bunch of ruins. They've left your servant's body as food for the birds. They've left the flesh of your faithful to the wild animals of the earth. They poured out the blood of the faithful like water all around Jerusalem. And there's no one left to bury them. We become a joke to our neighbors. Nothing but objects of ridicule and disapproval to those around us. And now Nehemiah is in the story and he is rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. We must understand before we go any further that the ancient walls serve many functions in old cities. In Deuteronomy 22... To help us understand the principle of the wall around the house in the Old Testament and, all, and also therefore it was reasonably concluded that this must be the principle around the wall of the city. And it says in verse 8 in Deuteronomy 22, Moses gave to the people from God the instruction. Whenever you build a new house, you must build a railing for the roof so that you won't end up with innocent blood on your hands because someone fell off of it. The idea of safety and protection so that no one on the top of the roof, your roof, would ever fall off and their blood wouldn't be upon your hands because we didn't build a fence or a wall around the roof. But what we need to realize is that in ancient times, even in the New Testament times, the roof was like a, a, a bachelor's pad, not only for bachelors but also for married people and families and great generations of relatives. It was a place of communion. It was a place of peace. And in 1 Samuel 9, we see that Samuel communed, he fellowshiped, he got together with Saul, King Saul, upon the top of the house, which is a place of relationship where people can get away from the family or from the affairs of business and commune to connect with one another about business matters or intimate details. It was a place of peace. Proverbs 21.9 is kind of uh, funny in a way. Um, but it says, better to live on the edge of a roof than with a contentious woman in a large house. The idea of peace was getting away from it all, whatever that all may be. Now, a place of relationship, a place of peace. And then we go into the New Testament in Acts chapter, nine, or, sorry, Acts chapter 10, and we read these words where Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And it was also that place of prayer because you could get away from all the noise and you would probably be out under the sky and see the wonders of nature and feel nearer to God. You remember the Lord often went up to the mountain. Jesus often went up to the mountain to pray. But in Matthew 10, 27, we also read that the housetop was a place of testimony. And Jesus said, What I say to you in the darkness, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, announce it from the rooftops. It was a place to stand up, to be heard, and herald some good news, whether good or bad. So see this housetop that this wall was put around was a living area. 
Maybe a study area of meditation. An area of relationship or peace, of prayer, of testimony. But it can become a dangerous place as well. Because we can easily fall down from it if it's not protected. The building of the walls around the cities was for protection and security. It primarily allowed for the people in Jerusalem to cultivate their spiritual lives without any interference from any other nations with pagan gods. It was a place of safety, not only physically, but spiritually. Now let me take the application like this to ourselves. See, we as believers all have spiritual walls of protection, of spiritual security that we put around ourselves and the disciplines that we're meant to exercise as God's children. Baptism is one. The reading of God's word is another. Prayer uh, daily before God, witnessing, witnessing our faith, the fellowship, getting together, the breaking of the bread, praying together. And there's many different exercises that are encouraged for our spiritual well-being that, that we can find in the New Testament as well. They are there for our protection and cultivating of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Nehemiah's struggle to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem helps us understand that we need to daily understand the state of our own spiritual walls. So how are they? How is our relationship with God? How are your quiet times, your times alone with God? <clears throat> How is your prayer life with God? How is your testimony and witness with God? Are you being influenced by the world around us? Are we careless and trying to go into the world from within? Are there some gates that we've left open for the enemy to slip through, to slip through? Has neglect of something loosened a brick or stone, exposing a gap for the enemy to squeeze through? Have the roots of the weeds of compromise grown into the foundation of the walls and are almost ready to tumble them down? See, if our spiritual walls, our, really our spiritual disciplines, are in need of repair, whether it's just one brick or a whole section of the wall, now is the time to implement the spiritual principles that we find in God's man for the hour in Nehemiah. Remember, he was a man of burden. And if there were personal walls that I had been talking about, there are also national walls. And as we look out, you, could, you, uh, you, you would have to say that uh, not only are personal spiritual walls at time confusing or in derelict, but nationally the walls of the so-called Church of Jesus Christ are crumbling down and, and corroding. And I want to ask you in the light of Nehemiah's great burden for his home city and the walls around it, do you have a burden for the church of Jesus Christ in the state it finds itself in this very day around the world? The wall building didn't begin with the mixing of cement. It began with the burden in the heart of a man called Nehemiah. It was, he was called to build the wall, yes, but it started first and foremost where he had to weep and he had to mourn and he had to fast he had to afflict himself because of the awful ruin of the people of God were in. And no other preparation for the work would do that. And I hope that we're all in the work of God in some way, shape, or form. Nehemiah was not a man to paper over the cracks of the walls. In fact, when Nehemiah met the people in Jerusalem, he didn't attempt to gloss over their spiritual condition, the condition of the walls. And in chapter 2, verse 17, it says, So I, Nehemiah, said to them, You see the great trouble we're in. Jerusalem is in ruins and its gates are destroyed by fire. Come, let's rebuild the walls of Jerusalem so we won't continue to be in disgrace. He saw the things that they really were. In contrast to Eli, the priest in the New Testament, uh, in uh, Samuel, who helped Samuel, the prophet, find his call. Eli refused to recognize the, re the need of the restraint, the walls of discipline in the life of his own sons. And because of that, he brought reproach, distress, and disaster on Israel. And Samuel reads that his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. He was unwilling to recognize the need of the hour. And Nehemiah was a man who was burdened because he saw things as the way they really were. And Hanani, his brother, came with the terrible news. I'm sure that Hanani had a burden on his heart too. He had seen it all. 
So we have to ask, did Hanani allow his burden to make him do something about it? We don't really know. But one thing is for sure. We can all shake our heads at times because we can even see what's going on around us and in us. And we can sigh over the state of the people of God like Hannah and I did. But the question is this. It's quite another matter to do something about it. And there is such a long journey between knowledge and practice. But the fact that Nehemiah was perhaps 700 miles away from the situation in Jerusalem, here in the palace... It made no difference. He was burdened about it. We don't have to be in the midst of all the sin in the world to be burdened about it. Our world allows sin to creep in. Our world allows sin to take over. And what we focus on, what we tend to focus on, is the devil that is actually distracting us, the enemy that is distracting us from even bigger things that are coming around that we have no idea That's how the enemy works. He distracts us. And he allows things that we thought are detestable now that actually become national law. So we pray, have a great burden for it. Nehemiah, when he heard the news, he sat down and wept. He mourned for days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He had a heart for the testimony of God's people. He was like Moses, choosing rather rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. What was the first work that his burden made him do? Pray. He prayed. He was a man of prayer. Verses 4 to 9, he was pleading to God for divine power. And instead of doing what we would maybe do and rush to the king, King Adaxerxes, that word's hard to say sometimes, I have served you for many years. He, didn't, he did not say this. and he, he also did not say, I've given you faithful advice in all my days. Can you give me a bit of advice and do something? And maybe wield the arm of power a little. He didn't go to the king. He went to the king of kings. If Nehemiah tells me anything, it tells me that Nehemiah was a man of prayer. And there's about ten prayers in this book. It starts with prayer and it ends with prayer. And in verse 4, Look at what he says. He sat down. He wept and mourned for days. He fasted. He prayed before the God of heaven. Verse 6. He cries out. He says, God, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I now pray before you night and day for all your servants, the people of Israel. He prayed night and day. Sometimes, truthfully, it's difficult for us to pray even 30 seconds. But he was so burdened that he got down and he prayed night and day. He prayed weeping for people. One of the cool things about the United Methodist Church is what a connection we are. Pastor Amanda and I have a great joy being able to tell everyone wherever we are across the state, even across the country, the kind of hearts that are in the lives of the people that are here in this community. We had some people that are voluntarily praying for y'all around the country in their Bible study, in their time of worship, I talked with one person yesterday that said each person in their congregation was individually praying for y'all, praying for the people here in Alto. 
What a great gift that is. Be a person of prayer to pray day and night. If we look at the dates in this, he said he prayed for four months like this. He may have fasted a meal or two for four months. But it says in the, in the month of uh, Chisley, which is the month of December for us. And if we go into the chapter, uh, in chapter 2, it says in the month of Nisan, his answer came. And that was the difference between December and April. Four months grieving, fasting, praying, weeping for four months. And it so altered his appearance that the king asked, what's wrong with you? And we'll see next week the king asked, what's wrong with your spirit? Do you know what was wrong? He had started the work already because prayer is real work. And it's the only work in preparation for doing God's work. Before a finger had been lifted to rebuild these walls, Nehemiah started 700 miles away on his knees. Chuck Swindoll he used to be president of Dallas Theological Seminary, but he pastors, he's authored many books, and, and he says, for many of us, prayer is too often an afterthought. Something rattled off at ribbon cuttings when the work has already been done. Many great leaders of our time have philosophized about what true leadership really is. Well, we have it in Nehemiah. Harry Truman, President Harry Truman of the United States said, a leader is a person who has the ability to get others to do what they don't want to do and like it. Crossing over from politics in the military realm, uh, Field Marshal Montgomery said, the capacity and will to rally men and women to a common purpose is a character which inspires confidence. To rally men, to rally people, to influence them to do something. Notice it doesn't say all men, all people. But when you read the great leaders of our own century, you will find that they tell us that great leadership is found in the capacity to influence others to do something that we know needs to be done. Influence is a key to leadership. So how can we influence people? Hudson Taylor reminds us and he put this into words saying, it is possible to move people through God by prayer alone. The pivot that moves God in this world is prayer. If you can analyze this prayer when you go home, if you could analyze this prayer, so reread Nehemiah chapter 1 every day this week. Allow it to be your prayer. And we see that it starts with Praise. He put out all of his mind, all the fears about doing this work. And he praised God. And that's why we talk about remembering to praise the Lord before you do anything else. Because it not only gives him his rightful place, it casts away the shadow of our doubts and fears that maybe, have come into the, that maybe we have come into the place of meeting with. In verses 6 and 7, he confesses to God, notice his words, that he puts himself in the, into the equation. I, and then he uses a plural, we. He's saying that it's not just all these people. He wasn't standing back saying, what are you doing? You've been here for years over and over in Jerusalem. Why don't you get the finger out? He put himself in the picture as part of the problem. And in verses 8 to 10, he goes on in faith. And he claims the promises that God had given to Israel in Leviticus and Deuteronomy all the blessings that God had promised them. And he goes to God. He says, Lord, open your eyes. <clears throat> open your ears. See, we'd be getting told, we have been getting told by theologians that the Lord's eyes are open and His ears are open. That is true. And we really don't need to tell Him. But the point is, is that's what was in His heart. He said, Lord, would you see our need? Would you allow me to know that you are seeing the need? He said, look at the promises that you have given us. 
And it all climaxes in his request, in his petition, all leading up that God would remove the problem and that, and that God would move this man at Xerxes to make Nehemiah do something about his problem in Jerusalem. Verse 11 at the end of the prayer, it says, I pray, I pray to you, Lord, your servant this day, grant him mercy in the sight of this man, in the sight of the king. I know we can get discouraged when we pray for blessing and the prayer for revival because we're expecting the answer in the next morning's mail. See, it doesn't work like that. Four months of fasting and praying and waiting upon God before Nehemiah got that first initial providential answer in the word of the king allowing him to go to Jerusalem. <clears throat> but I believe however long that Nehemiah had to pray, he would pray. Because Nehemiah was a man exercised of God. He had a burden and he was a man of prayer. We come very briefly to the third point of his characteristics. He was a man of burden. He was a man of prayer. But he was a man of action. He didn't only see the state of the, of the confusion of the dereliction and, and, and made these requests for divine power. But he made a sacrificial act of devotion. Basically he said, here I am Lord, send me. He enjoyed security. He enjoyed comfort in the palace that he had the prestige of being the king's cupbearer. But his love for God was greater than any position that he had or any uh, thought of power or control that he had. And he was willing to pay the ultimate price and give himself to the task that he saw needed to be done. I don't imagine him really wanting to make that trip to Jerusalem 700 miles away because that would have been uh, very arduous and very dangerous to travel that by himself, even with a, lo uh, a group of people. He did more than weep. He did more than pray. He made himself available to God to get the job done. Men like Nehemiah are not merely content to get answers to prayer, but they want to be the answers to prayer. He had the faith not to just not just to do it himself, but even to pray to God and the, and the other people would be moved and burdened and prayed to do the same thing. God always calls for a man or a woman of the hour like that. Samuel Chadwick, who was a Methodist preacher, once used the following words in a prayer that he was conducting in a church in Manchester. Now imagine him raising his hands toward heaven and praying, O oh Lord, Make us intensely, intensely spiritual. Now see, that's all of our prayers, isn't it? To be spiritual, to be connected to God all the time. We want to be intensely spiritual. But here's the next few words. But he says, but keep us perfectly natural. And here's the last words. Not only make us intensely spiritual and keep us perfectly natural, but make us thoroughly practical that we will be builders for God. The Jews then, like the people of God today around the world, are not as powerful as we think we are because we don't always rely on God. We don't always call for His power. We do things in our own strength and our own feelings. But in Nehemiah, one man made the difference. One person. You can make a difference. And we'll see in the next weeks that lie ahead that he took the Jewish people from great reproach in chapter 1 and verse 3 to great rejoicing in chapter 12 all the way to the end. God is still seeking people for this hour, willing to sacrifice for the work, laying our lives down, remembering Galatians and Galatians 2 where it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. It is no longer my desires who control me. But it is Christ who lives within me. It is Christ who guides me. And we get to be a living sacrifice in this world for God. Gracious God, thank you for the gift that you have um, given to us. May we hear just your word through your scripture. 
speaking to our hearts. May we be people of the burden that you have. People that connect with you in prayer daily. And people that are willing to do the work that you call us to do, not necessarily the work that we want to do, but that you call us to do, Lord. Help keep our focus on you because we know that when sin comes in, the enemy is trying to distract us and focus our attention off something even more uh, disgusting, more damaging that's coming down the pipe. Gracious God, may we have hearts and eyes and ears and tear ducts for our lives, for our families for our community, for our state, for the world that you have. And may we remember that you are calling each person here to be a Nehemiah, to build the walls of your kingdom. And we give you thanks. Amen. Let's...